All right, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to grab them and turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, this past week I was at a board meeting for HCPN, which stands for Houston Church Planters Network. There are eight of us on this board, and it exists to see the city of Houston saturated uh, with churches. The whole idea is to collaborate together, uh, churches of various denominations that are gospel-centered, and to collaborate in order to multiply, and uh, we just want to see as many churches as possible planted in the greater Houston area. Since 2010, uh, we have planted over 100 churches, and uh, it's more churches than that working together, but it's just a great organization uh, to be a part of. I'm grateful to serve on the board. Uh, Champion Forest is considered an anchor church because of our giving uh, to the HCPN and our involvement in it. And uh, it's just wonderful to be a part, again, of gospel-centered churches working together to plant more gospel-centered churches. And there's no other agenda except to advance the kingdom of God, the big K. And so it's wonderful. At our annual board meeting this past week, we always start uh, with uh, just an update on how we're doing, each of the board members. And we just go one at a time and uh, say what the last six months has been like, what are the next six months going to be like, the highs and the lows, just family, ministry life. And uh, the uh, director of the organization said, I want to do it a little different this year. And he gave us pieces of paper. And he said, I don't want you to just write on there uh, this last six months. I want you to draw a picture of the last six months or what you're going into in the future. And uh, so you need to know something about your pastor. There is this much creative juice that goes through my body, all right? I am not a creative Uh, I don't draw, I don't even think like that. But as I was looking at the last six months, looking at the next six months, I decided to draw this picture. I brought it for you so you could see it. I'll put it on the screen for you, all right? (laughs) That's the best I could do, all right? If you can't tell what that is, all right, that is a person walking on a tightrope, all right? Now, I don't know if he's happy or I I don't know what what he's feeling right there, but uh, that guy is walking on a tightrope. And I thought of this picture as I prepared for this week's message because truthfully, this is how I feel today. Uh, We're continuing uh, this series, Jesus On. And the title of the message today is Jesus On Marriage. Taken from Matthew chapter 19, I want to start in verse 3. I'll read through verse 10. The Bible says this. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? That's a key phrase. And he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And the disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry Now, do you see why I said this about walking on a tightrope? This, if ever there was one, is a very sensitive subject. And if I could be honest with you, transparent in this moment, when we were developing this series, I thought about leaving this message out of the series. There's plenty that Jesus spoke on, plenty of topics we could have addressed, And I was tempted to leave this one out. One, because we're going to have to tackle divorce in order to fully teach this text. And anyone who's gone through a divorce knows how very personal and how very painful it is to even think about. I'd much rather talk about this subject in a one-on-one setting where I can give you my undivided attention. Listen specifically to your situation because truthfully, every situation is different and therefore the advice and counsel I would give to people who are facing a divorce, have gone through a divorce, are considering a divorce, it would be different. It would be specific to the person and the situation. So teaching it in a setting like this, uh, a subject like this, just to give it this broad brush kind of way is not my favorite way to teach. 
But I also think to avoid it altogether is not the answer. To just preach on verses three through six, say what Jesus says about marriage and not teach fully the context and what he says about divorce would be a disservice to the word of God, which I'm held accountable to. It'd also be a disservice to many that even if done in the broad brush kind of way that I'm gonna do today, need to hear and wrestle with what Jesus said on this issue. And so here's what I'm gonna ask of you as we get going today. I'm gonna give this the next 35 to 40 minutes and I wanna ask you, number one, to be very patient with me. Stay to the end, lean in, listen to the very end. I'm also gonna ask you to listen attentively to the Holy Spirit. Every person in here is not in the same place as it relates to the divorce issue. And I believe God, the Holy Spirit, can take what we talk about today and it can be applied differently to different people in the room depending upon your specific situation and you're gonna have to listen to the Holy Spirit to discern his voice in his word so that you can be obedient to him. So there's a responsibility on both our parts. I wanna handle this in a sacred way. Believe I've done my due diligence to study and get ready for this message. I also prayerfully this week pray that the way I communicate this will be one of tenderness and grace. You have a responsibility to lean in, pay attention to the very end, and to give the Holy Spirit your undivided attention so that he can speak to you and we can get as much today out uh, out of today as possible. So I wanna begin Jesus on marriage and let's start by covering what God designs. We need to understand that God is the architect of marriage. He's got the blueprints. It's the first institution that he created before he created Israel, Before he created the church, he founded marriage. It was his idea. And this is what Jesus reminds these Pharisees of when they come up and ask him this question regarding divorce. He takes them back to the very beginning. Look at it again at verses four through six. Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together. Let not man separate. So let's just outline here the blueprint for marriage. This is marriage as God has designed it. First, I want you to notice that it's male and female. If you're interested in what we as a church believe regarding sexuality, I really encourage you to go online. We did a series two years ago called Chasing Sanity in a World Gone Mad. And I dealt with all of these issues, the biblical sexuality issue, transgenderism, the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of life. You can listen to all of these messages there. Most of the issues that we are dealing with in our culture today, if you want a biblical worldview regarding them, all you have to do is go back to the creation account in Genesis chapter 1. And this is exactly what Jesus does here. He's quoting what we read in verses 4 through 6. He's quoting Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24. And he states that marriage is between one man and one woman. In a word, we could say that marriage is exclusive. One man, one woman, that's it. The man leaves, this word is a deliberate abandonment. It's actually translated elsewhere as forsakes. He and she leave mother and father and they cleave to, they hold fast. They are united together. The word is to be glued together, cemented together. And get this, it's not something that man and woman can do. This joining together is something that is done to them. In other words, marriage is not only God's idea, but he's the one behind the actions taking place here. How else do two become one? This is something that only God can do. This is very, very important to understand because it's also something that only God can undo. More on that momentarily. So we say that marriage is exclusive. Marriage is it's designed is also sacred. Again, this is God's idea. He is uniting two people together and making them one. Uh, This whole idea of one flesh is not just the idea of physical intimacy, it's the intermingling 
of spirit and soul. This is one of the reasons that the covenant of marriage is important to the Lord because he's involved in it. I won't go too far down this trail, but marriage is uniquely spiritual. It is divine. At least from God's perspective, it is. In a way, it mirrors the Godhead, uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We worship a God where there is three in oneness. So too with marriage. God lives in us and unites us and we become one flesh, united in him together. I highlight this just to emphasize how important the marriage covenant is to God. And so it shouldn't be taken lightly, nor should it be entered into flippantly. It's not a TV show that you put a bachelor on, a bunch of bachelorettes, and they compete for a rose, okay? Did you see that this week? What came out? The Golden Bachelor? In the fall, they met one another. One was 72, the other was 70. They fell in love. They were married in January. And it came out just this Friday that they're getting a divorce. That rose wilted fast, all right? (laughs) Marriage is not... And again, we're looking at these subjects from the perspective of Jesus. This series is Jesus on the only perspective that really matters. And the perspective of Jesus on marriage is that it's not flippant. It's holy. It's sacred. The last viewpoint he had on marriage by design is that it's permanent. Again, he invented this. It's his ideal. And this verse, at least verse 6b, this is commentary that Jesus adds to it. So he quotes Genesis 127 and 224, but he adds his own commentary in the second part of verse 6 where he says, What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. This is what God designs. A marriage that is exclusive, sacred, permanent. It's his idea. He has the intellectual property on it. But... As is always the case, what God designs, Satan wants to destroy. What God desires, Satan, the enemy, wants to distort. What God unites and brings together, Satan wants to separate. He wants to divide. This is his modus operandi. And so before Moving on to the next section of the sermon, let's just acknowledge and talk very quickly about how Satan attempts to destroy that which God designs. And it's not hard to see because Satan's been running the same play since the Garden of Eden. It's not complicated in his schemes. And the primary way that the enemy works to destroy what God designs, the primary way he does this, is through our thinking. He gets into our Mind, because he knows that faulty thinking leads to faulty living. This is what Satan wants, to get in between your ears. This is the battlefield of the Christian life right here in your head. He knows that what happens in the mind plays out in time. And so he works overtime to cloud our judgment, to get us living off of emotions and feelings rather than truth, to distract us from spending time alone with the Lord so that our minds are not conformed to the world but rather transformed by the renewing of our mind. He wants us thinking less and less about what God wants, about what honors God, what makes God happy, and he wants us to focus on what we want and what makes us happy. Trace the rebellion of man all the way back to the garden. And it begins with Satan targeting the mind. Is this not what he said to Eve? He turned a period into a question mark. Did God really say question mark? If you want to know how Satan destroys and distorts. It starts with playing with our mind, tinkling with our thinking. Look at it in the terms of what we just discussed. Jesus says marriage is exclusive, period. And what does Satan do? Puts a question mark by it. Exclusive? 
One man, one woman? That's old school. That was written to a different culture, a different time. Not relevant for us today, question mark, where God put a period. Jesus says marriage is sacred, period. What does Satan say? Nothing sacred about it. It's just two people who come together. They, they fell in love. And if they fall out of love, hey, get a no-fault divorce. That's, that's, there's nothing sacred about that. Question mark where God put a period. Jesus says marriage is permanent, period. What does Satan say? He says, don't give me this covenant stuff. This is contractual for life, question mark. Maybe if they hold up on their end of the deal, maybe I'll hold up on mine. But the second I'm not getting what I need out of this, I'm out. And he puts a question mark right where God put a period. And it's with this thinking that he gets access to our mind where he does his best work as it relates to to destroying what God designs. And listen to me, the research proves this to be true. Pew Research put out a study in a document entitled A Religious Landscape Study. They surveyed 25,000 Christians regarding various views about different subjects. Listen to this. Of those who accept homosexual marriage, 25,000 Christians, of those who accept it, 60% of them admitted to never read the Bible or to pray. In other words, how can we expect them to hold to what God says when they don't read his his word to get his viewpoint on things? 28% believe in absolute truth, which means 72% of them said there is no standard of absolute truth. It's all a question mark thinking, and this is exactly what the enemy wants. And check this, when they were asked, how did you arrive at this belief? How did you arrive at this viewpoint regarding this subject? 61% of them said their views come from their own thoughts and opinions. If you've ever wondered, do we really need this series, Jesus on, the only perspective that matters, look no further than this right here. Because here's the deal, for Christians, Jesus' perspective is truly the only one that should matter to us. And we can't get Jesus' perspective if we don't get it from the Scripture. The only question mark thinking that a believer should have is what does God's Word say about it? That's the only question mark thinking that should enter our minds. Any other thinking will be faulty thinking that plays right into the enemy's hands and his strategy to destroy what God designs Because as we said a moment ago, faulty thinking leads to faulty living. Do not minimize, do not minimize the attack of the enemy on what God treasures the most. Namely, male and female created in his image and the uniqueness of the Imago Dei, what that means, as well as the uniqueness of the divine covenant that he created in marriage, which is a picture of his union with his people. If Satan is after anything, he's after these two things, and you see it more and more and more and more every single day. Now, because the enemy and his attempts to destroy and distort God's ideal and design, because of the original sin, which in the garden was pride, we want what we want, not what God wants. We question what God says. We wonder, why is God holding out on us? And because of this, sin enters the world in brokenness with it. And because there is sin and because there is brokenness, it, in course, involves people. And so, as we've seen, what God designs, we have to look around and go, because of the reality of the evil one and the sin and brokenness that exists in our world today, when it comes to marriage and divorce, we have to see from Scripture what God allows. This was the question that was presented to Jesus in Matthew 19, and it was meant to be a trap. Look at it in verse three. And the Pharisees came up to test him. That word test, it means uh, to tempt, okay? They were trying to set a trap for him. They were trying to trip him up over some nuance in the Mosaic law, and they said, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, in the days of Jesus, there were two Predominant schools of thought as it related to divorce. This is very important. The first school of thought 
was from a more conservative rabbi. The second school was from a more liberal. And all of their thoughts centered on uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. Specifically, verse 1. And the controversy was, how do you interpret what Moses said here? I'm going to put Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 on the screen for you. We'll look at it together. It says this, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. This is the text in question. This is the debate. What did Moses mean by this phrase, found some indecency in her? It's translated other places, a matter of nakedness. And so the two rabbinical schools of thought And we have these oral traditions passed down to us in a collection of writings called the Mishnah. The more conservative rabbis translated this indecency as sexual immorality, as adultery. That's what Moses meant there. The more liberal rabbis felt that Moses, if he wanted to use the word adultery, he would have used the word adultery. He'd come out and said it, but because he didn't, men could issue a divorce for any cause. And when I say any, I mean any. In this school of thought, the, an act of indecency was if, if a wife burned a meal, quote, if she spoiled a dish. And since Moses wrote in 24.1, she lost favor in his eyes, it could also mean that if he finds someone prettier or to be more fair, he could issue her a certificate of divorce. Now, question for you. Speaking to a bunch of men in what was a first century men's world, whose opinion do you think was more popular, the conservative or the liberal? The saying that would be more popular today. The liberal perspective. And it's in this context that this question is issued to Jesus. Now, just a couple of insights into how Jesus answered. First, he corrected what they said about Moses. Look at the original question again in verse 3. The Pharisees came up and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Jesus takes them back to the very beginning, to God's original intent. He doesn't answer the question at first, and so they push him on it. Look at verse 7. And they said to him, why then... Did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Now, a certificate of divorce was a legal document that was given mainly to protect women. Remember, first century, women were treated as property. And so this certificate was given to help women. So if they did remarry, there was legal proof, if you will, that there was a legal divorce. So Moses, in allowing for a certificate of divorce, is trying to make a positive for women out of a negative that he's dealing with with men who are just sending these ladies away, divorcing them for any cause out into this male-dominated world. And Jesus tells them this. Look at verse 8. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed. Notice he changed the words. They said, why did Moses command? Jesus corrects them. He said, no, no, because of your hardness of heart, which is an unrepentant spirit. Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, and he goes once again to God's original design, it was not so. And then look at this, very important. In a day where there are only two schools of thought, one divorce for any cause, or divorce due to immorality or adultery, Jesus picks a school. And he says in verse 9, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, it's the word pornea where we get our word pornography from, it's defined as, as any illicit sexual activity outside the confines of biblical marriage. That's a general definition of what that word means there. He says if anyone divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now, here's where we gotta listen in and pay attention. If you look in your Bibles, if you're preaching from an ESV as I am, there's a footnote given. And it says, some manuscripts add, you see it in little writing right there, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And then there's another footnote. And it says, and other manuscripts add, 
except for sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So we've got to ask this question, what translation is most accurate, and how can we know what Jesus is really saying here? Now, I need to say at this point that there are theologians, scholars, who have studied this for their life, and they differ across the board on their viewpoint on this, okay? But let me tell you uh, how your pastor looks at this, at least how he does at 11.46 p.m. on April the 14th, okay? I think I'm right. And if you disagree, I think you're wrong. But here we go. I think the translation that is best The most accepted reading of Matthew chapter 9, verse 19, for a number of reasons, is the last one given in the footnote. In other words, this is how I think it should be translated. As other manuscripts translate it, I'll put it on the screen for you, Matthew 19, 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I think this is most accurate first because of context. Again, remember who he was talking to and when he is talking to. This is a man's world. And what Jesus is saying is, look, think about what you're doing. Moses didn't give certificates of divorce so that you could just send your wife off like she's some piece of property if she doesn't please you. Any cause divorce? Are you kidding me? That's the furthest thing from Jesus' mind because he takes us back to God's original tent on two different occasions, verses 4 through 6 and the second part of verse 8. It's not let's see how easy it is to get out of this. Jesus is stating that divorce should never be the first option or an easy option, but instead should always be the last option. Add to this context the heart of Jesus, which we know was always for the poor, for the outcast, for the oppressed, for those who were broken and taken advantage of in society. And so what Jesus is getting at is this. If you're asking me to choose between two schools of thought, any cause or sexual immorality, adultery, I'm going to choose the hard way, the most difficult, because it's women who are getting the brunt end of the deal. You send them away, verse 9, you are making them, that word make, it's, it's, it's this idea of, it's been translated as well as force. You are forcing them to commit adultery. How else are they going to survive in a first century world except to marry someone else? And other men who want out of their marriage send their wife off for any cause, will now marry your wife who has a divorce certificate and it's just this merry-go-round of marriages and by doing so, the man marrying the divorced woman is committing adultery. You're making it happen by your choices. You're forcing it. William Barclay, noted theologian and scholar, listen to what, how he describes the background and setting of marriage in the first century. There is no time in history, this is saying something, when the marriage bond stood in greater peril of destruction than in the days when Christianity first came into the world. At the time, the world was in danger of witnessing the almost total breakup of marriage and the collapse of the home. So Jesus is fighting for marriage. He's fighting for the home. It's why he goes back to the original design twice, and it's why he tells these men, you send your wife off for any cause. You're making her commit adultery and making anyone who marries her commit adultery. We know this was a hard pill to swallow because of the disciples' response. Look at what they said in verse 10. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. The thought is, If I got to stay in this no matter what, except for unrepentant sexual immorality, it may just be better to stay single. And notice, Jesus did not argue with their conclusion. There's one other reason I think this is the right interpretation in verse 19. And that's because this is the second time that Jesus has said it. If you study the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Verse 31 and 32, Jesus says this exact thing verbatim. It is also said, Jesus' words, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you 
that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now think with me on this. Again, a male-dominated world. Men could issue a divorce for any cause, at any time, for any reason they wanted to. It's important to note that Matthew's audience is Jewish, so when he's writing, he's writing with a slant toward Jewish law, Jewish custom, Jewish people. In the Jewish world, women didn't have very many rights. They didn't have a whole lot of voice. And so Jesus ups the stakes for what is permissible regarding divorce. It's not just for any cause. He's looking out for the sanctity of marriage, this original design that God has. And as already noted, he's looking out for the safety of women. That's why we can state that if one is being abused in a marriage, if your safety is at stake, Jesus would not want you to stay in that marriage. In Jesus specifying, except for sexual immorality, he was talking to men. Both situations, look at it again in verse 31. Whoever divorces his wife, he's talking to men. That's his audience. If his audience was women, I'm certain he would counsel them that if they're getting abused, to get help, to ensure their safety, it makes no sense to tell a woman to stay in a marriage where they're being hurt, abused, taken advantage of, beaten. As long as that man doesn't physically cheat on you, you're bound to it. That is not what Jesus is teaching. So, we've looked at what God designs, and that's a marriage that is exclusive and sacred and permanent. We've talked about what God allows, and he allows for divorces in cases where there is unrepentant sexual immorality, where there is abuse, and I realize that when I say abuse, it can fall into big categories, be physical, verbal, emotional. That's why you need to listen to this Message along with listening to the Holy Spirit and wise counsel concerning your specific situation. I will say, if there is physical abuse, please tell someone you trust and let them help you separate as soon as you can. God also allows for divorce in circumstances involving abandonment. Paul wrote a lot about this in 1 Corinthians 7. Since we're looking at this from the perspective of Jesus and for time purposes, we can't get into that. Just know that Jesus and Paul are not on contra- no, they're not contradictory on this, okay? I also know that much could fall into the abandonment category. Abandoned physically, emotionally, spiritually. These are major issues that come up because of sin and brokenness that comes with it, and there are no easy answers or solutions. This is why I stated at the beginning, I'd much rather be having coffee with you and talking about this instead of preaching this broad brush sermon. I'll tell you this, you need to look at your situation very prayerfully. Don't sin against your conscience. Get wisdom. And when it comes to this issue of divorce, I just encourage you, don't minimize its importance and don't cheapen its value by looking for the easiest way out. This is what Jesus was most against. Divorce is costly. And anybody that's been through one will tell you so. No one wins in a divorce. When you take something that's glued together and you try to separate it, it doesn't come without damage. I remind all of us, though, what man can't separate, God can. And while all divorce, all divorce is caused by sin, not one divorce takes place where sin isn't involved. As we have seen, not all divorce is sinful. God allows for it in Scripture. Finally, let's look at what God desires. Let me say this first, and we'll look at this from a few different angles in the closing minutes of this sermon. Give me five to seven more minutes, please. First, know this. I'll put it on the screen for you. What God desires is what God designs. Okay, if you're here today and you're single, you've never been married, maybe you're a high school student, you're a college student, young professional, and you know marriage is in your future, want marriage to be in your future, what God desires is what he designs. He wants your marriage to be what it was originally designed to be. He wants it to be exclusive, sacred, and permanent. And so you ought to be working right now, 
not just on finding the right person, but on being the right person. That's why church is so important. Developing a, a biblical worldview. I worked with young singles for nearly a decade at my previous church in Dallas. And I'd always talk to them. I'd talk to these guys. And I mean, they're holding out for, you know, Barbie, Margot Robbie, I, you know, just beautiful. And they look like Jack Black, all right? I'm saying it ain't happening, okay? Like, <laughs> Make some compromises. But when it comes to spiritual concern, here's what I tell them. Listen, you go after Jesus, all right? You go after Jesus, and you look to your left, and you look to your right, and the one that's running after Jesus closest to you that's of the opposite sex, that's the one. Get after that one, all right? Um, You're here today. Maybe your marriage is in a tight spot. You and your spouse are on the outs, and you wonder, what does God desire for me? What does God desire for my marriage? What he would desire for you is to make sure your heart is first of all soft, that it's not hard at all, and it can only be soft when it's cultivated with the word of God, with the spirit of humility and confession of sin. And he would no doubt want you to work on your marriage, to get the help that you need, talk to a pastor, talk to a counselor, even if there's been adultery or abandonment, if you're still in the marriage, it's not over. If God can resurrect a dead person, he can resurrect a dead marriage. There is hope, and if I didn't believe it, I'd quit preaching Jesus. There is hope. There can be forgiveness and reconciliation if, if you both want it and are willing to work towards it. I feel like I need to say this because sometimes we hear this in a divorce. Someone will just casually say, well, it takes two. You didn't get there alone. Sometimes. Sometimes, though, all it takes is one to divorce. I've seen it. Many instances where only one side wants to work. Only one side wants to forgive. Only one side wants to do what has to be done. And as a result, the marriage breaks up and dissolves. Listen, if you're still married, God desires for you to stay married. And it may take some time to forgive. It may take some time to work through issues may be painful as you work through it, but God could be, could be writing a beautiful story of reconciliation and reconciliation and resurrection with your life that will help others in the future going through the same stuff you're facing now. And I know a dozen or so couples where this is the story. So just know if you're going through a tough spot, you're not alone. It doesn't have to be over. And I'm telling you, God doesn't want it to be over. And if you've heard anything of what I've said, that God is somehow pulling for your divorce, you have heard me wrong. If you're divorced, what does God desire of you? Same thing he desires of anyone, a relationship with you. And he wants your divorce to lead you into deeper levels of intimacy and trust with him. And he desires for you to know that you are not defined by your divorce. God doesn't label you. The world wants to label. Divorcee, adulterer, cheater, liar. That's, That's what the world does. The world labels. There are only two labels that God sees and makes, and that is inside of Christ and outside of Christ. So I just wanna say to those that are divorced, God sees you as you are, a son or daughter of God. You are not a label. And once you've dealt with your divorce, which takes time, and once you've made that decision to move forward, Paul gives some words concerning remarriage in 1 Corinthians 7. And make sure that whatever you do, if you do remarry, you remarry in the Lord. And if you have remarried, And let's say your divorce and your remarriage, let's say it's outside of the boundaries of Scripture that we've looked at today. My word to you is to just be honest about it, take responsibility for it, bring it to the Lord, and by His grace, move forward. Divorce and remarriage, even if outside the boundaries of Scripture, it's not the unpardonable sin. And you're not in a state of perpetual adultery. So don't walk in guilt. 
Don't let the enemy accuse you. You are in Christ. And in Christ, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. My goodness, if you've trusted Christ since those decisions of divorce and remarriage, you are now, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, a new creation. The old has passed, and behold, the new has come. So the only thing that should be defining us is our present relationship with Jesus. That's what defines all of us in the room. So I can conclude this message by addressing those that have been divorced and remarried. What does God desire of you? What God desires is what God designs. Make this marriage the very best it can be by giving it to the Lord And let's all seek to live out God's original design because our marriage reflects the God that we serve and it is our greatest tool in showing people what the covenant love of God looks like. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Thanks so much for watching. We pray you've been encouraged and challenged. At Champion Force, we focus on advancing the kingdom of God by making disciples, loving our community, and strengthening the church. We are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God and growing in their relationship with Him. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforce.org connect. Of course, we can't wait to welcome you in person at one of our three locations in the near future. For campus-specific times and details, just visit our website at championforce.org. We'll see you very soon.